famed $100 bill, Ben Franklin, uh, pictured here. Uh, that's what everybody knows you from, right? The president that's on the $100 bill? <laughs> what he said is, uh, the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system, which freed the ordinary from the clutches of money manipulators, was the prime cause of the revolution. Welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Uh, hey, you might be noticing that uh, the last couple of Fork Full of Noodles that you guys have watched have uh, some background laughter in it. And that's because they are recorded at the live virtual stand-up comedy shows called The Citizen Revolution. Each week at The Citizen Revolution, we talk about a different topic, a different sociopolitical or economic issue history, philosophy, that sort of stuff, and ideally we try to add jokes to it. Uh, and each week we also donate half of those ticket sales to a grassroots organization. For example, the episode that you're about to watch, we donated half of our uh, ticket sales to the Tidewater DSA uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, the Tidewater Democratic Socialists of America. So if you would like to be a part of one of these shows and support independent, socially conscious uh, stand-up comedy, uh, as well as a grassroots organization, then grab your tickets and come to one of these Citizen Revolution shows. They're going to be happening pretty much all throughout the year uh, in some capacity. They usually happen on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Tickets are only $5. Uh, if you want to give a little bit more, you totally can. Um, and if you don't get a ticket if you're, or if you're on financial hard times, uh, feel free to message me, and I'm very happy to give you a free ticket to come to these shows. Uh, so, so if you want to do that, check out the link in the description, grab a ticket, and come hang out at one of these shows. They're super, super fun, as you can hear. Uh, it adds uh, it adds a little bit of a little bit of a looser element to it. I know some of this stuff gets very scripted, some of this stuff gets very heavy, but uh, with an audience there, it's the closest thing to having a live performance. So once again, this is Citizen Revolution shows Friday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. I hope that you can join us. Uh, and if you want free tickets to these shows uh, all the time, um, along with a bunch of awesome uh, bonus content that no one else gets, you can become a sustaining member right on my website at krishmohan.com, or rather krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N dot com slash donate you can go there you can become a sustaining member directly on my website or on my patreon or via paypal uh, or Bandcamp. there's multiple different ways that you can become a sustaining member and get uh, free tickets to these shows to the citizen revolution shows you get unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content uh, you get early access to the full episodes of these fork full of noodles before anybody else gets to see them uh, and a bunch of other really cool stuff. Very little of, of my stuff is behind a paywall, but when it is behind a paywall, it's basically for, uh, you know, the sustaining members and things of that sort. So, and there's going to be some cool uh, stuff coming up uh, down the pipeline as well. Uh, so thanks for, for listening to these announcements, and uh, let's dive into this week's episode. Uh, here's where I want to start. I want to start way back in the 1700s, right? There was a Scottish economist by the name of Adam Smith, and he wrote that wealth is power. And that's just as true today as it was back then, right? I mean, look at somebody like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, the man was buff as hell, and he could stop like a moving train with just the sheer strength of his muscles. And then, exactly, that's what a train sounds like. Uh, so, <laughs> but, and then, and then once he stopped the train, he would make his pecs dance for the people. <laughs> He would do exact like he would do better than what I'm doing, but but you get the idea. But now he doesn't need to use 
his buffness for any of that sort of stuff, right? Because he has enough money to purchase that train company and then give that engineer a raise and then ensure that no train ever runs on that track ever again. So basically, he stopped a train and barely broke a sweat, but he still made his pecs dance for the people. That was nice. So wealth is power. So that's what Adam Smith wrote about. And right now in America, uh, we're not just facing like a vast income divide, right? We're also facing a major wealth divide. And in order to try to really understand this, we have to look at what income and wealth is. Now, income is the amount of money you make. And that's before taxes. It's before taxes, okay? Really, income ends up becoming like the amount you as a human worker are worth in monetary value on a yearly basis. It's nice. It's nice that they put a price on, on humanity there, you know? Now, in terms of capitalism, wealth includes the income but it's also your assets, right? Which is like the stuff that you acquired and how they appreciate over time. And by appreciate, uh, I mean that the stuff is worth like way more than a worker's income over time. Just way more. It's kind of like, um, appreciation is kind of like an unopened Star Wars action figure. You know, like, you know how, like, when you first bought that action figure back in 1971, it was worth, like, $1, but now, in 2020, it's worth, like, $86 billion, you know? <laughs> right? And if there was a factory defect, it's worth $128 billion. <laughs> so true. Or, or uh, what that amount... <laughs> What that amount is now known as is a half a Bezos. It's worth half <laughs> a Bezos. That's what it means to appreciate in value, right? But I'd say that that toy wasn't appreciated at all, right? You left a Star Wars action figure in the box? <laughs> what the, what do you, what do you fucking tell? What do you, like, Luke never fought Vader? found out that was his dad spoilers sorry you haven't seen a 40 year old movie <laughs> right yoda never yoda never came back to to teach luke you know you didn't you didn't create a new fantasy adventure that involved the return of obi-wan kenobi as an evil force ghost which is already better than the sequel trilogy ever could be <laughs> i mean i'd say that you didn't appreciate <laughs> that Star Wars action figure at all. I, I really, how could you appreciate something when you didn't let it live? <clears throat> now, we've come to this point in our society that the cost of living and food go up, but wages stay pretty stagnant. And not just that, but we don't value intellect or creativity or problem solving in our society, considering that when there are budget cuts, those are the things we cut first, right? It's like the educational equivalent of keeping toys in their original packaging. Don't let them go. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we've appreciated our stuff way more like we've over appreciated our things you know in this grand canyon of income divides we're living in a state where the worth of workers and the human consciousness is appreciated less than oh i don't know let's just say like a shiny rock or like a really big boat <laughs> <laughs> bullshit <laughs> So because of this income divide, there's 80% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck because worth and wealth for the average working class is directly connected to their income. And it's basically, so, so the workaday American right now is burdened with 75% of the debt in this country, right? From mortgages to car and student loans, credit card debt, and even debt to friends for bailing you out when you failed to be a drug mule because you were trying to pay off all of those other debts, <laughs> those debts are also overwhelming the American economy. And right now, if you take all of those debts together, the American populace cumulatively has 
$13.5 trillion in debt as of 2019. Now, in 2020, that amount has grown to $14 trillion uh, plus all of your firstborn children. It's really just going up. <laughs> you can have mine. <laughs> I, yeah, you're, getting, you're ahead of the curve if you want. <laughs> mine too. Oh, man, is everybody just going to give me their children? That's a very irresponsible move. <laughs> you can have my kids. <laughs> These are all very irresponsible moves. <laughs> Look, if, the, if that number of $13.5 trillion gave anybody a heart palpitation, that's not just the shock of the numeric value of the debt, but it's also the fact that unfettered capitalism is a health issue. Right? Millennials are, are, are likely to die 40% sooner than Gen Xers because the wealth gap has put them in a position that they can't afford health care for themselves or their families. Meanwhile, boomers just keep getting stronger and stronger despite the fact that there is a virus that is unleashed upon the planet that is specifically meant to kill them. Makes no sense. Now, According to the VP of strategy at Blue Cross Blue Shield, Mark Toluto, millennials don't see physicians regularly because uh, not just of, because of the cost of, of health insurance, but the trust between the doctors and the healthcare providers. But come on, why would we trust a doctor who just wants to dope you up and get free swag bags from a healthcare provider that just bought them a new Porsche, right? As far as I see it, that is as much our Porsche as it is your Porsche doc, okay? Considering that it was the pre-existing conditions that fucking paid for the thing, you know? State of, the, our, our state of healthcare is so bad to unfettered capitalism that millennials have no choice now to go back to using leeches to cure their migraines. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And spoiler alert, you guys, it doesn't work. <laughs> <It's a laughs> You're right. I don't think it would. <laughs> but here's the thing: we do it so we can like feel, you know, something. Now, <laughs> according to the Center for Disease Control, ninety percent, uh, ninety percent of expenditures of the uh, America's healthcare is on mental health or chronic conditions, which makes sense because a, a healthcare for a profit system is driving us fucking crazy. Real fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so because work conditions are going, uh, because of the, these conditions are going untreated due to lack of affordability, they worsen, and uh, a, a sick workforce leads to less efficiency or a stoppage of work altogether, right? At this point, even our illnesses want a general strike. <laughs> <laughs> This also proves that millennials aren't really lazy. We're, we're just too sickly to work. <laughs> Look, a, a very sick workforce can tax the healthcare system and create a lot of problems in the supply chain. Now, Mark Toluto of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield wants workers to work collectively with the insurance companies to help decline the rate of millennial health and uh, try to reduce the economic impacts. Now, work collectively kind of sounds like socialism, huh? doesn't it, right? Come on, Mark Toluto. If you're talking for Medi about Medicare for all, just say it, you know? You just need to come out and say Medicare for all, stop tiptoeing around and just ask us to the socialist dance already. You know, we'll say yes, probably. We'll do that weird middle school thing where we hold each other at the hips and are way too far apart from each other. You know, we'll do that, just say Medicare for all. No, but in reality, this is just about making sure that the insurance companies don't have to cover the bill, right? They, they want us to give up things like food or shelter or water to ensure that the health insurance companies don't have to be burdened with the costs of the sick. But they fail to ask the question, why do we need to make this Sophie's choice regarding our basic needs? Even Social Security is part of this wealth gap, right? Most average Americans contribute 
about 12% of their annual income to Social Security. But if you make over a million dollars, you don't have to contribute to that system at all. And if the millionaires and billionaires did pay their fair share into the program, there would be an additional $1.4 trillion for Social Security. The way the system is set, is set up, uh, it creates a health crisis that investigative reporter Nomi Prince, who wrote this article, uh, says unbalances the mind and body. The top 1% have their, don't, don't really have their wealth connected to their income because their incomes are, are only a small part of their wealth. Their wealth is connected to and cushioned by these created financial institutions uh, such as the Federal Reserve Bank or as the cool kids call it, the Fed. And just in case anybody is wondering, uh, I am one of those cool kids, you guys. So uh, yeah. I'm right here. Yeah, I am writing a whole show about economics. Tell me what's cooler than that, you guys. <laughs> Fucking nothing, that's right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty pretty cool. Talked to upwards of 10 girls in high school, so. <laughs> <laughs> about economics? About economics. <laughs> only, four of, only four of them were scared of me for the rest of the year. So that's a pretty good... <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good... Uh, pretty good hit rate on that. <laughs> now, most of you have recently heard about the Fed because back in March of 2020, they pumped about $5 trillion into the banking industry uh, and not into the thing that actually makes the economy run, uh, which is people. It's the people. <laughs> <laughs> and most of us think that the Fed is part of the government itself. And they're both right and wrong. So, so let's look at what this thing is and how it was created, right? So the first thing to note is that the Federal Reserve Bank is technically not a government institution despite its name. Just like Captain Crunch isn't really a sea captain despite his name. You know? What? Yeah, I do believe he's an what? admiral. Yeah, yeah, he's an admiral. <laughs> he's not actually a captain. Oh my God. Yeah, but they went with the alliteration. Yeah, they Just demoted lied. him for the alliteration. Yeah, it's very sad. It's a sad story. That's not what we're here to talk about, though. That's a different show. <laughs> <laughs> but the Fed is actually a private corporation whose sole purpose is to create, sell, and control the flow of money in the United States. It's America's central bank. And one of the main functions of any central bank is to create money and loan it out to sustain the economy. And really, the founding fathers of the United States were 100% against the idea of a central bank for the United States of America. Famed $100 bill, Ben Franklin, uh, pictured here. Uh, that's what everybody knows it from, right? The president that's on the $100 bill? What he said is uh, the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary from the clutches of money manipulators was the prime cause of the revolution. It's a big quote. Basically, once people saw the tool of money was being used to control and manipulate them, they pushed back to try to regain that control. Now, in the 1700s, the way they decided to do it was a violent revolution, right? And, and that was very possible because most of the people in the 1700s were way better at cardio than any millennial today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's mostly because most millennials today are dying both on the inside and on the outside, so. <laughs> <laughs> And look, this sort of stuff really isn't taught in schools, right? Because it's not sexy to think that bank tyranny and Excel spreadsheets caused the revolution. Revolutions are supposed to be cool, you guys. And banks are basically where, I don't know, you go to like look at charts and statistics nobody really understands, you know? 
get confused what about what a Roth IRA is and why you need them. Now, kind of famed $2 bill, Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he said, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the uh, issue of currency, the banks and the corporations will grow up around them, will deprive them of their property until children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Bam. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Basically, yeah. what ben, uh, Thomas Jefferson is pointing out there is, uh, is the fact that Bank, the Federal Reserve, that the, one of the jobs of Federal Reserve is to loan out money and they control the military because they control the military budgets. That means that that homey kind of dopey looking banker that you see making dad jokes in his office is just as bad as Dick Cheney. Yeah. Who, well, if anybody he, needs a reminder. Has was, he shot his hunting buddies too? No, but that's what I'm saying is he's just as bad as a man <laughs> that shot his friend in the face and then made his friend apologize to him. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's Dick Cheney. <laughs> famed, <laughs> famed sociopath Dick Cheney, you guys. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's how banks operate, right? Banks start pay for these wars and then they get mad at the countries that we bombed and they're just like, hey, look at all these all this money you made us spend, you jerks. Come on, get out of here. Making us bomb you and stuff, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so if the people that wrote the Declaration of Independence and came up with the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and how to have game when you still have syphilis, uh, Ben Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> if if the founding fathers were against the idea of the centralized bank how the hell did it come into existence and then gain this much power well in the early 1900s uh central banks had been abolished in america but big industry robber barons like your jp morgans the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds and of the like they were all trying to control and pass legislation to re-centralize the banking industry so they'd have more control over it. In 1907, JP Morgan actually started a rumor that one of the most prominent banks in New York City was about to fail and then people just started losing their shit. JP Morgan, publicly considered a financial luminary at the time, exploited his mass influence by publishing rumors that a prominent bank in New York was insolvent or bankrupt. Morgan knew this would cause mass hysteria, which would affect other banks as well. Yeah. So, uh, president at the time, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, authorized Secretary of Treasury, George Courtleyu, to give J.P. Morgan $25 million to help out these New York banks and maintain faith in capitalism. Morgan instead helped his friends out and ensured the failure of certain banks. The banks that Morgan didn't bail out called in their loans and people had to sell property to pay those loans off. So in turn, a hot piece of gossip was able to take down the American economy. Now this gave uh, bank these bankers a huge leg up in passing this new legislation called the Federal Reserve Act, which was written in secret on an island off the coast of Georgia. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that the ten or so figures who attended were told they could only use their first names in addressing each other. After this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. Now, the only way that this could have been worse is if this bill had been written in the state of Florida. 
Guys, a bill written in America's dong would very blatantly fuck over the American people. <laughs> I mean, really, think of how much worse the Fed could really have been had it been written a hundred miles further south. You know? It's fucking terrifying. <laughs> Now, as you heard in the video, senator, uh, senators like uh, Nelson Aldrich, uh, who had connections with, uh, with bankers like J.P. Morgan, uh, who he would marry into J.P. Morgan's family a few years after he uh, pushed for this legislation to be passed. And there was massive opposition in Congress to this bill. Finally, during the election of 1912, Democrat Woodrow Wilson was financed by these bankers, and he vowed to pass the Federal Reserve Act. And in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, when most of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. So, along with the Federal Reserve Act, Woodrow Wilson also passed the Espionage Act, which essentially criminalized military criticism, which put socialist presidential candidate Eugene Debs in prison and consequently is responsible for the illegal imprisonment of Julian Assange today. It's also the predecessor of the Patriot Act. And I think unequivocally, we all here can agree that Woodrow Wilson is officially the Florida of presidents. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that guy's the dong of all presidents in america <laughs> that's what he is <laughs> now the way the fed finally secured all of its power was after it caused the crash of 1929 in 1933 the fed seized all of the gold and abolished the gold standard which made the printed money legal tender with nothing to back it except the word of the Fed. Now, having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve bankers decided that the gold standard should be removed. In order to do this, they needed to acquire the remaining gold in the system. So, under the pretense of helping to end the depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in America was required to turn in all gold bullion to the Treasury, essentially robbing the public of what little wealth they had left. And at the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished. If you look at a dollar bill from before 1933, it says it is redeemable in gold. If you look at a dollar bill today, it says it is legal tender, which means it is backed by absolutely nothing. It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives our money value is how much of it is in circulation. Therefore, the power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value. So, after the Federal Reserve Act was basically, this means that uh, our money is is faith. It's uh, it's religion in this country. That's really what this means. It's not backed by anything. It's backed by absolutely nothing. I think I goofed up on leaving that up for a second. So this is essentially like the first cash for gold scheme, right? That's basically <laughs> what the Fed really did. But this makes American currency completely faith-based. It is, it is a religion in this country, right? Thanks to, the, thanks to the Fed, we have a centralized bank a centralized currency, and a centralized God, and that is the dollar bill. Honestly, at this point, I don't even know why we have churches in this country, right? Like, everyday evangelicals should just go to a bank and hold a mass inside there, right? Your tellers are your priests. <laughs> it just makes more sense. <laughs> but, you know, look, we're in the age of the quarantine. I get it. You know, we're in the age of the quarantine, so we should be responsible and we should hold masks in front of an ATM while wearing masks. Everybody should be <laughs> wearing masks. You could be in a drive thru so you could be in your car, too. There you go. Look at that. Yes. Drive through religiosity. I love it. 
<laughs> now, just as a reminder, the Fed came into existence because of banker gossip, a clubhouse with no girls allowed in Georgia, <laughs> voting on Christmas, and the ownership of Woodrow Wilson. In 20 years, the Fed cheated its way to ensure its power to make, distribute, and loan money for the entirety of America. In 20 years, the Fed amassed so much power by controlling the wealth in America that it essentially became a god. Now, Mayor Amschel Rothschild has said, uh, give me the control of a nation's money supply and I care not who makes it who makes its laws. This is basically an admission that a nation isn't its people or its laws or its constitution, but rather its money. The creation of the Fed was pitched as an economic stabilizer, but it is responsible for some of the most heinous acts of violence we've seen in the 20th century. This system has consistently widen the gap of wealth and power in this country and should be seen as an insult to what the United States of America stands for. The Fed is virtually responsible for every single one of America's economic crashes, right? Now, when it was created, you can see how that's possible, right? I mean, it's still young. It's still trying to figure things out. You know, it's like a toddler learning to walk, you know? Accidents are going to happen. Milk is going to be spilled. Someone's going to take a shit on the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do, you know? But over 100 years, you would figure that the Fed has its shit together. But no, it's just drunk on its own power. And we all know that uh, drunks are, uh, are just big, smelly toddlers. That's all they are. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> shitty with money, too. And very shitty with money. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> now, after the Federal Reserve Act was signed in 1913, the first thing they did was basically get ready to cause a crash, right? From 1914 to 1919, the Fed doubled the money supply, and then in 1919 said the country was broke, so it had to call in all its loans. This is basically the same thing that they claimed was happening in 1907. So really, all they did was kind of play their number one hit single for like four straight years. That's all they did. Now, by 1920, there were panics everywhere. People were pulling their money out of uh, basically every bank that they could think, especially these smaller community-based banks. And those banks went bankrupt. So they were bought up and consolidated by some of the bigger banks who all had connections to the Fed. Senator Charles Lindbergh said that under the Federal Reserve Act, panics are scientifically created. The present panic is the first scientifically created one uh, worked out as we figure out a mathematical equation. Guys, that's the power of math right there, you know? It can create an astronomical amount of panic when it's used for evil, but think how awesome it could be if it was actually used for good, right? I mean, we would be, we would be well on our way to the Star Trek universe if we use math for good, right? I feel like we would all have replicators. I could have a cake whenever I wanted. These are all very positive <laughs> things. <laughs> that's, that's really all I want. I just want instantaneous cake. I'm a very simple man. <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> now, after seeing what the Fed was actually up to, President Florida man, uh, Woodrow Wilson, made this statement. Uh, he said, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great <laughs> industrial nation is now controlled by a system of credit. We, no longer ha we are no longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of a majority, but a government by the opinion and the duress of a small group of dominant men. He said this on his way out of office. Now, Good job, Woody. He did it. <laughs> eventually, I feel like the lesson there is eventually Florida men can have conscience. You know? 
Right as they're about to die. Right as they're about to die. They're just like, oh, man, maybe I should have done all those fucked up things. (laughs) (laughs) There is hope for Florida yet. We just have to figure out a way to kill it. (laughs) 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 Now, uh, Senator Lewis McFadden had pointed out that the Fed had usurped the United States government, and he was one of the biggest proponents of pushing back against them. In 1921, the Fed introduced something new to ensure that people would have faith in the market again. They called it a margin loan. Basically, uh, you purchase a stock option at like 10% of the value, right? And then you get a loan from the bank for the rest of the 90%. The way it works is they would appreciate over time and then you can pay off the loan and make money on the back end. But here's the catch. The catch is that that loan can be called in at any moment and you have 24 hours to pay it. This would basically be like having a child play with a Star Wars toy, but then the store says that it wants the toy back and you have one day to box it up perfectly. That's some that's a real dark side shit right there. <laughs> <laughs> Super fucked up. Actual loan sharks aren't that mean. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Yeah, loan sharks give you a little bit of time. You know, there's a, there's a leg-breaking procedure in there. Uh, you know, they'll still take you to the hospital. These guys are just being assholes. Also, is this not, like, the laziest way of making money ever, Right. Like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and make an honest living, you monetary maniacs. <laughs> now, in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and everybody involved with the Rothschilds and everybody within that class of people pulled their money out of the market, which was investing a lot in margin loans. Once they did that, the market crashed. And all the loans were called in after they had depreciated and hundreds and thousands of Americans lost everything. And it's considered one of the worst moments of American history. This is what we all know as the Great Depression. The economy basically looked at what the Fed was doing and was so upset about it that it tried to kill itself. (laughs) And, the, and then the Fed just wouldn't let it die. <laughs> Is that joke a little too dark for some folks? <laughs> <That's great. laughs> I wrote that and I was like, I don't know if this is too dark or not dark enough. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on, Mohan. <laughs> now, Lewis I McFadden. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> Uh, Lewis McFadden, uh, the senator from before, who's been against the Fed this whole time, right? Uh, after, after the crash, did try to hold an impeachment trial to disband the Fed. But instead of disbanding the Fed, he had two assassination attempts on his life and then was finally poisoned before the impeachment trials could even begin. And these tactics were all repeated in 2008. Again, the Fed cut interest rates for the bank to ensure that they could lend more money to people. And then Wall Street and the banks loaned out those monies at, at these you know, high interest rates. And then when the markets crashed, the people were left in the wake. I mean, this is basically a remix of their number one hit single, right? Manipulate the market to create panic. Which, okay, look, I get it. That's like not that catchy of a title, right? But remember, that hit was written in 1914, which is like way earlier than clickbait. Like they didn't have clickbait (laughs) articles back then, (laughs) you know? And now and today, 12 years later, they're doing it again. Back in March, the New York Fed said it would offer banks $1 trillion in overnight loans with no interest, in addition to pumping another trillion dollars in 14-day loans on a weekly basis. This was basically meant to soothe the banks, you know, like a baby that was not just born, 
<laughs> not just born with a silver spoon in its mouth, but also has a silver spoon to melt portions of the economy to inject it directly into its own ass. <laughs> <laughs> Now, back in 1913, <laughs> back in 1913, the Fed was pitched as an economic stabilizer. And once again, things are no different, right? Macroeconomist Stephen Friedman, Friedman, it doesn't matter. Stephen Friedman, let's call him Friedman. Uh, he says that the Fed is a shock absorber. And he's absolutely right. It absorbed the shock of a crash that it created only to electrocute the American public with poverty and stress-induced comas. <laughs> and also in March, we, March was a big month for like financial fraud, you guys. They were fucking killing it in March. Mercury must have been in all sorts of retrograde for this shit. Uh, <laughs> also in March, we saw a bunch of senators sell their sh uh, shares of stocks before the market crashed and then they made millions of dollars right before a global pandemic, which is no different than what the robber barons did in 1929, right? They sold all their stocks because they knew what was coming. They knew what was coming because they orchestrated it. They're, they're, friend, they're like the friend that, that kind of like gets you drunk on 4th of July, right? And then tells you to fire bottle rockets everywhere, you know, and then the rest of your homies' cars are just, like, on fire. But this evil <laughs> friend of yours, this fucking guy, he took a cab to get to the party, and he insures everybody else's cars. <laughs> the fuck are you putting in those bottle rockets? I don't know. Let's say vodka. You set a whole car on fire. <laughs> I want some. <laughs> <laughs> I want some. <laughs> These are special bottle rockets. These are Fed bottle rockets. <laughs> now, here's the concern for the Fed today, right? It's that people are selling their stocks because a lot of people are now realizing that it has no real value, right? It would be like trying to buy food with actual Monopoly money. <laughs> which don't do that, that's bad advice. Uh, I'm not recommending that. The stock market can't buy you food. You know, it's basically a vehicle to make rich people feel like they're important. And the average working class work person feel like they're not working hard enough, right? And the real reason the Fed wants to give banks more money is because it makes more money on the interest from the banks itself. Look, this is a clear indication that the people have lost faith in this currency that the Fed has control over. And we're basically saying, fuck it, we want to be in charge of it. People don't want stocks, they want food and water and health and shelter and safety. Instead of Harry Pottering an economy based on a banking spell, the Fed, <laughs> yeah, they could have used those trillions of dollars on purchasing food from community farmers, milk from dairy farmers to feed people, and help funded medical equipment for hospitals. I really feel like a fucking comedian shouldn't have to spell this out. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are in this nightmare hellscape that we live in. <laughs> Look, the Fed has proven time and time again that its need to have power through wealth will mean that the people will be the victims of its tyrannical greed. The markets aren't real, but this health crisis is, and this creature from the capitalist lagoon will be the end of us by not letting us die a goddamn natural death in peace. <laughs> now, one of the other major purposes of the Fed is to loan money out to the government. This means for every dollar that the government gets from the Fed, it has to pay that dollar plus the interest. And the only way for the government to keep ahead on all of this money that it borrows and, and keep up on the interest as well is to borrow more money from the Fed. For 
every single dollar produced by the central bank is loaned at interest. That means every single dollar produced is actually the dollar plus a certain percent of debt based on that dollar. And since the central bank has the monopoly over the production of the currency for the entire country, and they loan each dollar out with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money to pay for the debt come from? It can only come from the central bank again, which means the central bank has to perpetually increase its money supply to temporarily cover the outstanding debt created, which in turn, since that new money is loaned out at interest as well, creates even more debt. The end result of this system without fail is slavery, for it is impossible for the government and thus the public to ever come out of the self-generating debt. Now, remember, the government doesn't really make money, right? Rather, it comes up with a budget for the Fed to loan to the government. And this is basically the trappings of a debt economy. And this is why capitalism is a snake that's both eating itself and vomiting itself out simultaneously. It's super gross, you guys. And when it comes to debt as a form of control, nothing locks in that social control like war debt. Uh, wars are typically paid for with debt because right. it is too dangerous right. for a government to say to the mass of people, you're going to have to pay right now for this war, right. so we borrow to postpone it. Right. That way the children that are older can go fight and die, and the children that are younger can pay for it later. Right, exactly. Now, basically, what's, what's being pointed out there is that the Fed loans more money to the government when they're at war. So to the Fed, wars are incredibly lucrative. And here's the harsh truth for the Fed, right? Most Americans, for how much chest thumping and flag waving and dick measuring we do, most Americans don't actually want to go to war. But they're usually coaxed into supporting it. Now, for America to get involved in World War I, the ship Lewistania was deliberately sent into German waters. Now, despite going into war-torn waters, it was still safer and cleaner than a Carnival Cruise Line. <laughs> so, and the Germans actually sent a warning that basically said, come on guys, this is fucking stupid, right? By putting an ad in the New York Times itself. But nobody listened, the ship was sent in, Eventually, the ship was attacked, a bunch of Americans die, and all of a sudden, America's got war fever, you guys. And we spent $30 billion on the war effort. Yeah. J.D. Rockefeller personally made $200 million in 1919. By today's standards, that's, that's at least a quarter of a Bezos. That's <laughs> <laughs> like minimum, you guys. During World War II, uh, FDR used a bunch of economic sanctions on Japan to provoke an attack, right? He halted trade, he froze Japanese assets, he aided Japan's enemies with supplies, which are all against the rules of war for a neutral party like America. Look, you can't just passively help one side and then still claim neutrality, right? That's, that's like when guys come out and they're just like, hey, just a tip, what if I just... What if it's just the tip, right? Like, when they really mean that they want to fuck, like, that's... Look, it's stupid, it's dishonest, and nobody wants to see your dick, even if it's just a tip. <laughs> now, three days before the attack on Pearl Harbor, Australian intelligence told America about the attack, and FDR ignored it. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, one million soldiers volunteered for service. But that's not all, you guys. J.D. Rockefeller was profiting from both sides. His company, U.S. Standard Oil, was partnered with IG Farben, the company that provided explosives and chemical weapons to the Nazis. U.S. Standard Oil provided fuel with a specific additive to help Nazi fighter planes bomb London. 
Rockefeller was one of the men responsible for writing and pushing the Federal Reserve Act. And he's also kind of like an OG in the war for oil. You know, he kind of like invented the game in, for, in the war for oil. Like he was kind of badass about it. That's on his, that's on his resume. <laughs> But you guys, that's not all. The Union Bank in New York was a Nazi money laundering front that was called into trial after the war. And the vice president of the Union Bank of New York was none other than Prescott Bush, the grandfather of one George W. Bush. I mean, the, the Bushes, you know, they really made war criminality like a, like a fun family activity. You know, it's like, it's like something you like to pass down from generation to gem generation, you know, like a, like a commemorative plate or like Huntington's disease, you know, cause <laughs> <laughs> that joke is literally for like three people, uh, <laughs> because most people have no idea what the fuck Huntington's disease is. <laughs> it's a genetic disorder. Uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's funny. <laughs> I <laughed. laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> Sometimes I write jokes specifically for like two people in the crowd. <laughs> and I'm just like, well, fuck everybody else. As long as. They... <laughs> That's the way to do it. <laughs> That's... That's why I'm killing it, you guys. <laughs> That's why I'm so cool. And I've talked mm -hmm. to upwards of 10 women, just in case anybody forgot. Um, <laughs> about economics. About economics. <laughs> <laughs> now, remember how I mentioned that 80% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck and are burdened with three-fourths of the debt in this country? Well, there's an easy way to get out of that debt if you join the military. If you create the debt, and then use military service as a way to pay those debts off, it creates a forced voluntary military, which basically justifies fighting more wars for longer periods of time, which means that that's more wealth for the Fed. You, you fight these wars, usually with poor people as your soldiers. Right. We call that the economic draft. Right. Everybody knows about it. You fight the war, but you borrow the money. Well, the only people who can lend money to the government are people who have a lot of money right. to lend, which means, Banks, right away, right. we're talking the top 5%, 10% of the right. population. So we're all in hock to the rich for decades right. to pay for the war today. It's an extraordinary burdening of the mass of people disguised with all the patriotic hoop de doo right. that you can see. Yeah, they actually hid the cost of the war, by the way. They, not only did they do this borrowing, but then they hid the borrowing because they made it an emergency resolution mm -hmm. so we didn't even see it. But a key thing that changed was we relied on a voluntary military, which meant that for the first time, America was disconnected from the stresses and strains of our military and their families. And this created the kind of notion that it was just a lifestyle choice. Historically, we fought until the war was over. As citizen soldiers, we fought until the duration. But if that duration is suspended forever in animation, then you have a further notice war and a professional class that is making their living by keeping the war going. And hence, surprise, surprise, we don't win them. The Fed is key to the functionality of the American war economy. It's the primary funder of these never ending wars and its biggest beneficiaries. And this basically means that the American economic stabilizer is kind of based on the destruction of other nations that we gleefully take part in after we're manipulated and get drunk on our own ignorance. So, if a centralized private corporate bank like the Federal Reserve isn't going to work because of, you know, it's war crimes and like laundering cash for fascists and like ensuring the working class stays indentured and impoverished, what's a better solution to the problem? Now, some might say 
it's best to get rid of the idea of money and go towards like a more logical resource-based economy, such as one Jacques Fresco made, suggested in the 70s, right? But I don't know if we're there yet. You know, we'd have to start by like canceling the game of Monopoly, you know? <laughs> like when we get to that point, maybe we can start talking about a resource-based economy. <laughs> And by the way, this is not me saying that I'm against resource-based economies. I don't think it would be a bad idea, rather the opposite. I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, and I did a whole video about it like two years ago. Uh, and now uh, I'm not allowed to talk to anybody at Wells Fargo or Chase Bank. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I count that as a win though. I count that as like, that's a personal win for me, <laughs> you know? But it is going to take time to get to a resource-based economy. So in my opinion, we should work on putting the steps in place to get out of this profit-driven death cult that is capitalism, where, you know, we like pay dues to meet our own demise. It's fun. It's a fun, it's like a fun club of death. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you have to, you have to pay to get your own Kool-Aid in this cult, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Super exciting. It's so hard if you didn't bring your own cup. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get a penalty if you don't if you don't add something into the Kool-Aid itself. So more immediate solution to the problem of the of Federal Reserve and centralized banking itself is public banking. And a public bank is exactly what it sounds like. It's a state, a city, or a county that runs its own banking system and it uses loans uh, to fund more community banks and credit unions at lower interest rates. Uh, and then it uses those interest rates to fund like public projects and utilities for everybody to benefit from. <laughs> Holy shit. Can such a thing like that actually exist? Sure does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, public banking is um, basically democratizing finance. It would be cutting out the Wall Street middleman and allowing the power of banking to uh, be a public utility, uh, similar to, uh, you know, a government that isn't totally corrupt. Yeah, a public bank makes banking a utility so it's accountable to the people that use that bank the community of people are the shareholders not some fucking james bond will in in a in an ivory tower you know it's definitely not jd rockefeller who was best friends with nazis uh <laughs> look here's my point we are all accountable to banks to pay back the loans we take out from them. So why aren't the banks accountable when they like fuck up and, oh, I don't know, collapse the entire economic system around us? Or, I don't know, just kind of spitball in here, like create a genocidal world war to profit from. Yeah. How, about we make, <laughs> how about we make them accountable for that? When, we actually do have something like this in place. There's actually a very prominent public bank in place in the socialist paradise of Bismarck, North Dakota. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> That's right, you guys. Uh, the Bank of North Dakota is a public state-owned bank that was created by farmers in 1919 and was able to weather the 2008 financial collapse. Those farmers in 1919 were basically tired of having banks in cities like Minneapolis, uh, you know, the liberal bastion of Minnesota, uh, <laughs> and, and New York City control who gets the loans and how much they get, right? Their, their point was basically like, they're not living in, in North Dakota. They don't know what these communities actually need, so why are they determining how much and what these communities get in terms of money? Right? So they decided to pool their resources and create a state-run bank that was more about cooperation and community rather than competition and corruption. 
with that in mind, the Public Bank of Los Angeles has a movement that's picking up steam. In 2019, they did lose, uh, unfortunately, they lost a, a city-based initiative to create a public bank, but they took the momentum, they took the popularity of their movement, and they took it to the state level and, and won. They won having a, a public bank in the state of California. Uh, we led the Measure B ballot measure campaign in Los Angeles last year, and we had four months to organize on a grassroots budget, minimal funding with no infrastructure, trying to change a section in the Los Angeles City Charter to pave the path for an L.A. City Bank. And we came close. We got 44 percent of the vote with 430,000 people voicing their support for a public bank. And we immediately took that momentum and pivoted towards a statewide effort. Um, and just last month, Governor Gavin Newsom signed a bill. And now California is the first state in a century to enable cities and counties in California to create their own public banks. So we lost the battle, we won the war, and it's been an incredibly exciting fight because this uh, bill, yeah. AB 857, the Public Banking Act, was a grassroots initiated bill, drafted, conceived of from the grassroots that challenged the most powerful corporate lobbyists in the world and succeeded. Public banks basically do what the Federal Reserve claims it does and actually provide stability for their state, their city, or county by reinvesting taxes and interests to the state itself, right? A major thing that these, these public banks do is uh, it would help the underbanked or the unbanked communities in, in a lot of these states and cities, right? 30% of people in Los Angeles don't have access to a, a, a bank account. And if you don't have access to a bank account, you can fall victim to predatory lending practices like payday lenders, check cashiers, who basically take up a, a portion of people's wages. Plus, we'd lift the burden on mattress companies to make products that can also hide cash. <laughs> And, you know, they can, like, go back to focusing on products that just help us sleep at night. And honestly, I, I think we'd all be sleeping way better off knowing that our communities are being taken care of. And the most I'd vulnerable... sleep pretty good if I knew my mattress was filled with money. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, like, like, it already came filled with money? Like, that's not... Yeah. <laughs> well, like, like, there's money in the thing I got from Ikea. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't stop <laughs> stuffing mattresses with money. Damn I, you, I, Swedes! <laughs> I think they're banking with the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, honestly, wouldn't we all sleep a lot better, right, knowing that our communities are taken care of and, like, the most vulnerable in our society aren't being preyed on by capitalistic vultures? I think that alone would extend millennial lifespans by... I don't know, like 15%, probably. At least 15%. So, Dr. Martin Luther King is quoted to say, when machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. The Federal Reserve funds the military, pushes people to purchase things we don't need for the sake of more debt, and supported OG fascism. John D. Rockefeller, homies with some Nazis. Uh, they're basically the giant triplets all rolled into one. Divesting from Wall Street and the Fed shows the powers that be that we want to put the power back in our hands. Wealth backed by the people is far more valuable than wealth backed by some vapid, greedy old men trying to play God. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please give it a like. 
please give it a share. Get the word out about these things. Content like this often gets suppressed. Uh, it doesn't really get shown to as many people as it possibly could because it's not content that YouTube finds or Facebook finds particularly friendly to the algorithm. So I depend on you guys hitting that like button and hitting that share button. And make sure that you're subscribed to get more videos like this. I put up videos on this channel pretty consistently. Uh, there are at least uh, three to six videos that go up on this channel every single week, maybe more. Sometimes I get the chance to do more, sometimes it's a little bit less. Uh, but videos like this, videos like The Fork Full of Noodles, videos like The Dispatch, which are more uh, current events and news based rather than big idea based. Uh, we do some ranty stuff over some news stories that might have slipped through the cracks that corporate mainstream media isn't talking about. And of course, stand up comedy clips. Uh, that I will be posting uh, infrequently throughout the year since I'm not particularly doing live stand-up right now because of the uh, because of the current pandemic situation we're in. Uh, but that's why we've pivoted to the online mode. So uh, like I mentioned at the top of the show, these are part of the Citizen Revolution live stand-up comedy shows. And if you would like to be a part of the audience in a future Citizen Revolution live stand-up comedy show, grab your tickets right now. The link is in the description or you can grab it directly off of my website as well. I'm pretty much gonna be doing these for the duration of the year. They happen on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Tickets are only $5, they're only $5. Uh, you can donate a little bit more if you would like, and we're gonna be donating to, um, to, to amazing grassroots uh, organizations, activists, journalists, um, people that I think are very important right now that don't have any sort of corporate funding. They are funded much like myself by the people, by, by people that watch their things, by people that believe in what they're doing. Um, so if you want to be a part of that, you can uh, check out the links in the description or go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. While you're there, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make an additional donation, a, a one-time donation if you would like to, uh, directly from my website uh, by going to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N dot com, H-A-H-A dot com slash donate. I'm fucking up my own website, you guys. Um, but uh, sustaining members uh, get uh, a, a free ticket to all of the uh, live virtual stand-up comedy shows that I do. Uh, they get uh, additional unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling material. Uh, they get um, early access to the, the comprehensive full episodes of Fork Full of Noodles. And there's gonna be a bunch of other cool stuff that I'm gonna be trying to do, uh, particularly for the sustaining members as well. Um, maybe some Q&A sessions thing uh, specifically for, for them and, and things of that sort. So uh, I'm working on those sort of things right now. Um, so, so becoming a sustaining member gets, gets you access to a bunch of different stuff. Um, it's it, between the Citizen Revolution shows and the um, sustaining memberships and the donations is pretty much how I'm going to be making my living uh, f going forward till we are out of this pandemic world. Uh, so if you want to be a part of that, if you want to support independent media and a, a grassroots organization, please do uh, consider becoming a sustaining member or grabbing a ticket to one of these shows. While you're on my website, you can also grab a copy of my brand new album, Politely Angry, uh, available on all of, the, all of the platforms that it would be available on, uh, from your iTunes to your Pandoras and your Google Plays and your Deezer and so on and so forth. Uh, the album talks a lot about um, uh, how religion and e economics are connected together, how religion and capitalism are connected together, uh, the, uh, the problem with uh, the prison industrial complex, and of course, I'm going to take down Jeff Bezos. I'm going to do a little takedown of Jeff Bezos because that guy fucking deserves it, right? So uh, if any of that sort of stuff interests you, please grab a copy of the album. Uh, it, it's also available on Bandcamp for $1 uh, so that no one gets priced out. Um, and I am also working on planning uh, to donate one half of um, the album sales to a grassroots venue uh, that I have worked with in the past. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys uh, consider uh, donating to that, um, purchasing an album and helping out. 
Uh, and I also have a merch store now with t-shirts and mugs and a bunch of other cool stuff uh, that's also available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys come and check out uh, more of these videos. There's a, a bunch more coming up. Uh, I post pretty frequently on this channel, so if you're new, uh, please make sure that you uh, have subscribed to get updates. Uh, and if you are a returning viewer, thank you. You're fucking awesome. Uh, but also, please make sure that you are continue to be subscribed to this channel because uh, sometimes they unsubscribe people. So and with, with all that said, thank you so much. 